comment is that I'm very proud of you, Lou, as I always have been, for uh, your cogency and your, uh, your, how should I say, forthrightness, which sometimes, truth be known, gets the better of you, but never mind. The better of you is still in your work. So I thank you for that, Louis, and I know that everyone who has read you and, of course, knows you personally, I think would agree with what I have to say. That's all I wanted to say, a personal note of thanks. Well, that's very kind of you. You know, Moshe is a great Canadian composer and the founder of the Vancouver Intercultural Orchestra, uh, is, is well aware of many cultures and many philosophies, also descended from, a, from, from a, an eminent rabbi, a rabbinical family. Um, and, uh, you know, Moshe and I are friends almost 50 years now, so uh, there's hardly anything we can say to offend each other anymore, but uh, there's a lot that we can say to praise each other. And Moshe, I, I just reflect back to you my, my respect for your ability to take in good spirit uh, things which you may, you know, disagree with. We don't have to agree on everything to remain friends. And that's a lesson, you know, for, for cancel culture too. People don't have to agree with each other all the time. I remember a time when families voted differently, uh, when families could have different religions and still sit around the dinner table and be a family, irregardless of their differences. Yes, because we're bound by something higher, uh, be it the love of friendship, what, what's called philia among the Greeks, and that transcends many, many differences. So thank you, Moshe. I look forward to our next 50 years. Absolutely, Larry. Uh, Sasha, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Lou, I, 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 can only, uh, I can only join the congratulations by others, and I'm really, I'm absolutely thrilled by, by this book, and it continues your, your uh, precious mission in, in the movement, and, and, and broader than that. Uh, there's one question that seems uh, crucial and remains unanswered for all of us who are involved in philosophical practice. And that's really this ongoing question that's always coming back, the question about the relationship between psychotherapy and philosophical counseling and, you know, this, this debate about whether psychotherapy is medicine, whether it's a, a humanistic sort of activity and discipline, whether it's closer to therapy proper and whether, you know, it's closer to philosophical counseling. And we are now seeing, as far as I can tell, uh, a fairly decisive shift uh, uh, of psychotherapy towards philosophical counseling, towards ret uh, towards returning to, to philosophy. We, we have the, the emergence of these new psychotherapeutic journals, such as uh, Philosophical Psychology and uh, uh, Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology and all these now, now, now major journals, some of them published by the American Psychological Association. And, and a lot of uh, psychologists are flocking to undergo training in philosophical counseling. Uh, so uh, where do you see the future of psychotherapy? Do you think that, that, that psychotherapy will, will, will eventually return to its philosophical roots, at least uh, uh, to a large extent? Or do you think this, this initial conflict will persist? Because in some parts of the world, there isn't much of a conflict. There's more, more of a convergence, I think. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you a quick answer, and then I'm going to invite Beatrice to also answer, because she has got a foot in both camps now. Beatrice Popescu, who is both a clinical psychologist and has recently completed a PhD in philosophical counseling and handles both kinds of clients, and therefore on a daily basis makes this kind of call, is this a client she's qualified uniquely when someone comes to her practice to decide whether to use clinical psychology or to revert to philosophical counseling. So she has insight, and, and I want her to share in a few words, you know, an answer to your question, but just let me say, Sasha, for those of you who don't know, uh, Alexander Fatik is, uh, is, is a very prominent philosopher in Belgrade and is one of the, is the pioneer, really, of philosophical counseling in Serbia. He organized one of the internationals there in 2014 and has written many books on virtue and other allied subjects. So he's a great philosopher in his own right. I think there's always going to be a gray area I think, Sasha, if you look at the popular movements in psychology in the West, positive psychology is built on virtue ethics. And, you know, you have RET, you know, built on stoicism. You, you have now mindfulness abstracted from Buddhism. But psychologists are always looking for something to make hay with. And then on the other hand, you have many who are more closely allied to the medical model. And in the United States, they're seeking not only 
do they have diagnostic privileges? They also want prescription privileges. They're not medical doctors, but they now want the same prescription privileges that medical doctors do in the mental health arena because they're able to make the diagnoses. So you have that divide to contend with. But there is a gray area, and I agree with Beatrice. I don't want to, to, to anticipate what she's going to say, but I think in her thesis, which I helped supervise, it's very clear that the harder we try to demarcate the, the, the more clearly we're going to recognize a kind of a, a kind of intractable overlap, there's still going to be an undefinable no man's land or a gray area between philosophical counseling and psychotherapy. Beatrice, would, would you like to chime in and answer Sasha, please? You're muted, Beatrice. Oh, sorry. Um, um, yes, um, actually, this is... Um it's a huge debate um, in uh, um, in our profession uh, regarding uh, suitability and uh, and also um, client selection. Um, I'm talking about the, um, uh, the overlap between the psychiatry, medical profession, and psychotherapy, and the same thing with uh, would actually apply to psychotherapy versus uh, philosophical counseling. It is very difficult to. Um, uh, to make um, the selection pro process, um, and uh, um, I mean, my uh, my thesis uh, um, works towards uh, offering not offering a solution, but uh, uh, probably uh, putting asking um, other questions regarding the process. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't actually look at the uh, overlap, the, the idea of uh, overlapping, uh, but um, the idea of uh, complement complementing um, um, both domains, um, um, for example, um, uh, in one of, of my uh, sub my sub chapters, so where where I um, um, provide a, a guide, um, a selection guide for making you know the referral pro process. Um, well, in one of the subchapters, I investigate a um, few of the most ethical uh, issues in the in the counseling and mental health. Um, the first, I mean, the most important being client stability and client selection. Um, and I'm uh, stating that uh, they must be explored in connection. Uh, client selection deriving from uh, client suitability and, or unsuitability for a certain approach. Um, so, client stability is uh, certainly an important ethical issue in the philosophical counseling profession. But how do you know what makes somebody a good client for philosophical counseling, or what makes somebody unfit to be a client for philosophical counseling? The same question is asked when we refer to the stability of the client of psychotherapy or other psych psych psychiatry services. So, things are not, you know. Uh, clear cut. Um, using diagnostic tools like clinician instruments and tests makes us more aware of the client's problematics and uh, psychopathological is issues and also allows us to make an informed recommendation for the client, either referring him to a psychiatrist or psychotherapist or both. Um, regarding psychotherapy, there are no approved protocols for establishing the suitability of a client or a patient who enters um, the psychotherapy or psychological counseling. Uh, specialists, we, uh, the therapist re relying on the client's clinic, on, on, on our clinical sensitivity or diagnostic skill. Um, what, I mean, um, I, could, I could go on and on, but um, what what is to, um, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm not trying to uh, to draw a line, uh, but more uh, you know um, help our uh, my peers my uh, my peers psycholo psychologists and and uh, and uh, psychotherapists um, offer them the advantages of being a philosophical culture uh, because you know although the roots of uh, of the um, cognitive behavior, behavior and psychotherapy are in the stoic movements, okay, or in the in the stoic thinking. Um, they um, in uh, psychotherapy they never um, 
you know, they they actually forgot about uh, developing uh, this issue. They 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 actually forgot about uh, un, um, anti philosophers about Stoics, and uh, they are now claiming themselves as being what being a, a evidence based uh, psychotherapist. So it's it's pretty confusing, but. Uh, we need to, to refer to the first that uh, um, put our, uh, you know, um, our tools in hand, in, in a way. I mean, we have to, um, to admit that um, philosophy uh, or, or psychology was derived from philosophy. So uh, we, we, we don't need to forget the this uh, um, actually th those important uh, facts. Well, I don't know whether I made myself uh, <laughs> very clear. Yes. Thank you. If, if if I may jump in, just a uh, little, if 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 you, if you will allow. Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Yes, uh, I mean, Lou was probably the first person uh, in the world who uh, uh, in, in, uh, who so powerfully questioned the social role of antidepressants with his Plato no Prozac. And we now have, like uh, two months ago, we have this, this huge paper published in uh, the Journal of Molecular, Molecular Psychiatry, which, which shows and proves <clears throat> that uh, antidepressants, the selective uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors, are not, in fact, working on depression, that depression is not a chemical imbalance. That, uh, and, and, and we now have this, this debate within psychotherapy, especially led by American psychoanalysts such as Jonathan Shadler with his famous paper in, the, in, in American Psychologist, which basically push psychotherapy uh, uh, towards philosophy and, and deny the evidence-based paradigm of psychotherapy and, 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 and deny the medical pretensions of, of psychotherapy. So, 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 so it seems that Lou's prophecies are, are <laughs> sort of uh, manifesting in, in the actual uh, life of psychotherapy. Well, thank you for that, Sasha. Just let me say this, that, uh, and then we have Michael Laster, who, whose hand is up. Uh, but it's really, what I like about Beatrice's approach is it is not either or. Uh, I mean, she's saying, and I'll just reiterate something important that she said, that, that, Psychologists could really use more philosophical culture in the sense of being reacquainted with the parent discipline. So they need, as Beatrice says in her thesis, and she argues quite eloquently, that psychologists need to be more philosophically cultured, to be more well-rounded as psychotherapists, but also, and what she doesn't say so much, and I think it's really important, I know Vana agrees and Rick agrees and practitioners generally agree, that we as philosophers need to be more careful in uh, recognizing psychopathologies when we meet them, uh, because we're not really trained to do this. And people who suffer from genuine psychopathologies, whatever they may be biologically, um, are not generally suitable for philosophical counseling. So I think both sides need more education. And so instead of a debate or a war or whatever it is, we, we need to have more dialogue and more fruitful interactions between the professions and among them, including psychiatry. So the interactive way will, will, will benefit everybody, including the patients at the end of the day. Uh, Michael? Michael? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as someone who's not uh, that familiar with your work, I found this to be a fantastic introduction. And um, I, you know, everything you were talking about, like, just feels like such common sense to me during these crazy times. And um, I did have three questions that I came up with. Um, and so I... I think it would be best to ask them uh, one by one uh, if you have the time. Okay. So, so you brought up uh, non-duality earlier, and you know that's that's a topic that I've been interested in for like nearly a decade, and I'm wondering whether uh, that's central to philosophical counseling, like transcending the subject-object split. And um, if it is, 
you know, do you think one needs to have a somewhat healthy ego first before attempting to pull the rug from under their feet? I'll, so let, Rick, I'll let Rick summarize his view. This is a, we could have a whole conference on non-duality. There, there, are, there are centuries of, of debate on this in India. We, we don't have time even to, to begin to do justice to that. But first of all, just let me say, say this to you, that uh, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a contest you know, between one school of thought or another. It's not always necessary that philosophers be acquainted with Indian philosophy. If it happens that philosophers are acquainted with it, it can be a very valuable tool in philosophical counseling. Uh, but but Western-oriented philosophers can do perfectly well with Western tools, okay? So that's, you know, that's the first point. We don't foist a system on our clients unless we think that the, if the client is acquainted with this, it might actually help them in some way. But that's... Uh. That's because the, because it sounded like uh, in part of the presentation, it, it sounded like you were saying most uh, psychotherapy ends up being like Sisyphus because it keeps like trying to, you know, um, you know, cultivate like a stable ego. I, I do believe that this is only personal and it's not anything that APA says. It's not anything that anybody has to agree with at all. I believe by definition, the ego is unhealthy. Yeah. So if you're talking about a healthy ego, it's an oxymoron. It's never right. going to become healthy. And the more you feed it, the unhealthier it becomes. It's, it's, it's a ravening beast. And the more it gets fed, whether it's being fed psychotherapy, whether it's being fed Prozac, whatever, you're trying to feed the person to make them happier or feel better. Uh, if you're trying to make them uh, healthier in an egoistic sense, it will all, all, almost always fail one way or another. Whereas in, in my own experience, when, when the ego is able to, to be dissolved, even for a short time, the dissolution of the ego is what produces healing. Right. Eating of the ego is what produces discontent and egoism and narcissism and worse things. Right. So, okay, Rick, maybe you want to speak very briefly to non-duality and then we'll come <laughs> back to your next two questions, Michael. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, the philosophy of non-duality is just one among many different metaphysics and APA has no commitment to any particular one. Um, Lou and I are very good friends, but I completely disagree with his view of <laughs> ego. I think that you need to have a very strong and healthy ego before <laughs> you play around with trying to transcend it. Um, but, uh, you know, I have written a lot about that uh, and I have this whole philosophy about it, but that's just my particular view also. So there's no necessary connection uh, between APA and any kind of view about duality or non-duality. Um, but in my own writings, I, you know, I'm strongly influenced by Buddhist practice. But I think that the more you practice things like mindfulness and whatnot, your agency increases while your sense of self also becomes so much more malleable. But this is just my own Rick Rapetti's. And that's about all I have to say about it. Right, but we have we have Vikas Baniwal in, in, in with us. Vikas, are you able to unmute? I mean, you're an Indian philosopher. Would you would you like to give an answer about non-duality? <laughs> could you give a brief answer from your perspective, please? It might be enlightening. <laughs> oh, thank you, Liu, uh, for inviting me. Uh, actually, I uh, kind of have a middle position here. It's a sort of Martin Buber's position where I find that non-duality is an encounter which uh, happens sometimes, but most of our lives are lived in dualities. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's in between the middle way, I think. Great. That, that, that's a great answer. I don't think we, any of us will disagree with the middle way. Thank you, Vikash. And by the way, it must be the middle of the night in India. So uh, uh, thank you so much for staying up late to be with us. Uh, Michael, what's your second question? No, I feel honored that my first question, you know, illustrates like a central wedge between you guys. That's great. Um, yeah. My second question is... Um, are you familiar with the work of John Vervaki and uh, Ken Wilbur? 
<laughs> yeah, Ken Wilbury very much. So by the way, I'll turn this over to Rick too, because he's been on Verbaki's podcast several times. So oh. he'll, tell you, he'll tell you about that. You're really hitting some bullseyes <laughs> today, Michael. Let me say to you this though, because philosophers are famous for one thing. We never agree about anything at the end of the day. And this is why we could never become a cult. No one could ever accuse us of becoming a cult because if you know if you have a cult or you have a religion, then there are usually some shared core beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's how you're identified as a member of that particular. <laughs> but if, if you're not a cult, then it's harder to market, too. <laughs> well, that's right. That's, yeah. that's, that's perhaps a, f a failing. But, you know, the <laughs> great success of, of, our, of our community internationally is that we don't need to agree about everything. Right. We don't even need to agree about anything. But we have one meta agreement, and that is that philosophy can be useful and helpful to people. And it should be so. Uh, that we agree on. But exactly which philosopher we're going to select and for which reasons and what we adhere to personally everyone's all over the map as philosophers have always been and we think that's a virtue it's plurality of a very wholesome kind i'll say briefly that john verveke is uh not only a friend of mine but a colleague we're working on writing something together about the paradox of self-transformation i've been on his voices with verveke uh, about five times now i'm involved in a whole bunch of other projects with him uh, but he wants to learn and become a philosophical counselor, I should mention. Uh, yeah. And uh, Ken Wilber, uh, integral theory, that's just a whole nother, that's like another metaphysics, I would say, which tries to integrate a whole bunch of different metaphysics in a very intelligent way. But uh, once again, this, like Lou is saying, philosophers are, you know, all over the map. And APA, and, you know, philosophical counseling is not committed to a particular content view in philosophy so I'm not uh, sure. yeah and, thanks and that's one of the beauties just just add to to what rick said and then your third question but let me say this to you that uh, philosophical counselors are each working in their own way according to their own lights so if you're seeking a philosophical counselor you should not expect that every philosophical counselor is going to give you a uniform assessment or uniform interpretation it's more like a dance our modality is dialogue not diagnosis so if you're having a dialogue with somebody it becomes like a dance and if you're dancing you always want to have a dance partner who, who who somehow suits you you know so you don't step on each other's toes and so it's incumbent on the client to find a philosopher with whom he or she can dance well in terms of a, of a dialogue so th this is a, an opportunity for people to conduct an exploration and not expect every philosopher is going to uh, you know treat them uh, in, in the same way because we're all different. So it's not medical and it's not psychological and therefore it's a different kind of thing. That's another way of distinguishing it from psychotherapy. Although psychotherapists are also very different, but they're trained to, to be more uniform in particular kinds of diagnoses. Yes? So what's your third question? Um, well, to backtrack a bit, like I brought up John Vervaki because like he has a great series called uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And, um, you know, I was just thinking like it would be great if, if like maybe you did something similar on YouTube. So and and I imagine like you'd be more much more accessible than he is because he tends to be very like, you know, academic in his rhetoric. And uh, so it would be great to like have, um, you know, I know you have a YouTube channel, but like, you know, like a series sort of like he does to sort of popularize your ideas would be great. Well, thank you very uh, much for the suggestion. I think Rick, uh, Rick was intending to introduce us at some point. So over to Rick. I mean, Rick knows John yeah. Rebecca exceedingly well, and he looks like he's agreeing with you. Rick, do you have, do you have a follow up for that? Yeah, um, that's a great series by the way the one that you mentioned um what's it called again awakening from the meaning crisis but he also has voices with verveki which where he interviews all sorts of people like me and whoever else and and um yeah i've been planning myself i haven't even discussed this with lou but uh, i'm going to start um a series with john john and lou both contributed to my recent book the rutledge handbook on the philosophy of meditation I'm going to start a series. John's going to be my co-host, and we're going to get people like Lou and others who are interested in the philosophy of meditation 
to be on that series and we're going to co-publish it on each other's uh, platforms, John and I. But I'm also thinking about doing something where I interview, uh, we just, uh, it's like philosophical counselors. So people like Lou and all the other people in this room, it'd be great to start putting out stuff on YouTube like you suggested, just talking about philosophical counseling and, and, you know, interviewing different philosophical counselors just to get a, a, another platform, another place where anybody can easily go on YouTube because lots of people, that's where they get their knowledge nowadays yeah. is on YouTube. We like to listen to things. We don't have time to read. We, we drive and listen, etc. So that's one of my plans. I, I didn't even discuss it with Lou yet, but it's just synchronicity that you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, great, great. So my third question is, do you think it's growing increasingly harder to have healthy individuals when they have to adapt to an increasingly pathological society or in some way do you think it's a good thing because like with all the chaos they're more open to being you know to questioning their reality and uh you know become willingly disillusioned the, but, the latter the latter case certainly is resonating with us the pandemic was horrible in more too many ways to to mention but it did create more opportunity for philosophy you know and especially for philosophical practice to gain a foothold in virtual spaces so appa itself has had increased traffic to our site, increased requests for programs, uh, increased uh, clientele coming to people for philosophical counseling. Uh, what we've experienced in the three years of the pandemic is that practical philosophy has definitely flourished, partly because of the horribleness uh, and the need for people to reinvent themselves and also to become more philosophical about all of the confusion and the chaos and the madness, because that's a coping strategy at the end of the day. Philosophy becomes a coping strategy, trying to make sense of things. That's what philosophers do. Let me just say to you personally, and then I'll invite other comments to your, to your question, Michael, for which I also thank you. It's my personal opinion that uh, what you said about society and what you hinted at about society is, is unfortunately the case. Uh, I'm tending to view mental illness uh, uh, to include wokeness. See, and I'm not qualified to diagnose anything. <laughs> The wokeness that I'm seeing now, the stage four uh, political correctness that's evolved into wokeness, it's a mental illness. It needs to be diagnosed by those who make diagnoses. Uh, people who wake up in the morning and are furious and agitated and unhappy and see only the bad in everything and have to destroy and don't know how to create and are taught to hate – uh, and to point the finger and blame all of their discontents on some mythological, uh, you know, uh, group. That, uh, th th this is this is verging on. It looks to me like mass psychosis. And unfortunately, we've seen this in history, too. When cultures get propagandized, uh, they, they're capable of succumbing to it. We're succumbing to it and we have to stand up against it. So on this note, Caesar raises his hand. Let me introduce uh, our common friend, uh, our friend in common, Caesar Civetta. It's nice to welcome you to something for a change. Caesar is the, <laughs> is the founding director of the, of the Beethoven Festival Orchestra. He's been producing amazing musical shows for a couple of years. Uh, Caesar and Moshe and I have been collaborating and David also. Um, and Caesar, I'm so happy to see you in the house. And uh, please go ahead. Well, congratulations, Lou. I'm so excited for you. And uh, if you haven't already uh, read it, I just want to recommend I'm pouring through it the last few weeks. This is uh, Lou mentioned earlier, originally published in 2007, but this is the 2020 edition. And uh, The Middle Way, wow, this is just unbelievable. And I want to also quote my favorite passage. He wrote, accosted by political extremists everywhere, I too, have finally been driven to an extreme, the extreme center. It's peaceful here and quiet. Everybody else, it seems, is busy hating one another. <laughs> so, one more time, congratulations, Lou. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caesar. Uh, it's 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 a great to, to see you here and uh, great that we're able to interact philosophically as, as well as musically. I, I really appreciate all of this. So uh, you're, you're a great friend and 
we have a lot in common, Caesar and I, and we've been collaborating, and we'll continue to collaborate on musical and other projects. But Caesar, uh, you also said to me after you had delved into the middle way that you thought it should be required reading uh, for all yeah. university students. And that's probably true, but it will also be probably required shadow banning by all university administrations at the same time. Uh, any any administrator at City College who reads this would certainly not recommend it to anybody. We're a public institution, so the First Amendment still applies. But there are many, many subjects that have become taboo in our current society. We are simply not allowed to discuss things that most urgently need to be discussed. And these things will not be discussed on CNN nor on Fox. Uh, but it's only by airing uh, the forbidden things that we can possibly emerge from this madness. Um, so I'll leave it there. But you're very courageous, Caesar, and uh, and I applaud all that you're doing for music and your vision of a, of a multicultural classical orchestra without the black tie and, and without all the appurtenances of snobbery and with your tremendous abilities as a conductor and interpreter of great music. Your, your Beethoven Festival Orchestra is going to be a resounding success, and I look forward to, to your premiere. Okay. Uh, do we have any anyone else in the house who, who would like to uh, comment? Vana has been very quiet. She's a founding member of APA and uh, one of and a colleague for I won't say how many years, Vana, because I don't want to date you. But we've been we've been together since the first international we met in Vancouver uh, in uh, 1994. And Vana has been a close confidant and a great contributor over the years of publications and advice and counsel and everything else, including friendship so i would invite you to unmute and say a few words well i want to congratulate you on another uh, another book <clears throat> you uh, can publish faster than i can read it seems like these days um <clears throat> but i i am familiar with quite a few of the uh, um essays um that i've heard over the years and it's just a joy to have them readily accessible um I'm buying, I'm, I had the uh, um, um, electronic copy, but I'm getting the hard copy, hardcover copy, because I want it to be something that I can pull out of the shelf and access immediately when I'm thinking about something that uh, issue that you've raised. Um, quite some time ago, I talked about different roles that um, different countries and uh, associations stress uh, for philosophers to play. And one of them that you have uh, done so much to emphasize in this country has been developing philosophy as a profession and being a professional. And you are a consummate for prof professional. Um, I you know, had used you as a counselor at some very troubled times of my own life. So I know exactly uh, how uh, illuminating your dialogues can be. Um, you've also been a wonderful role model for us uh, in so many ways uh, as an activist. Um, and that has been uh, such an important thing. Um, so, um, Again, uh, I want to congratulate you on not only this work, but taking the time that you have taken to develop philosophical practice and to develop the American Philosophical uh, Practitioners Association. You've been very, very generous with your time and just an inspiration to us all. And this, uh, this book uh, of collection of essays, I think, will just... Uh, 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 add to that that role that you are playing. So thank you so much for everything. Oh, Vaughn, you're, you're more than welcome. And I, I've said many times at APA meetings, and I'll say it here to, to everyone, that one of the great joys of serving uh, APA and serving the cause of philosophical practice has been the people, the wonderful people whom we've attracted, uh, including our international membership and all these pioneers in so many different countries. Uh, it, it's a joy to see it flower and fruit in so many places. And Vaughn, after all, you're 
you're the mother of APA. I mean, you've been around since the beginning. We both came from an older association that wasn't quite constituted to fulfill, uh, you know, the, the role that APA has to fulfill and does. So you you are one of the most seasoned and experienced and wise practitioners in the world, not only just the USA, but you're pioneering. For those of you who don't know, Vana, who's giving me so much credit, Vana was a professor of philosophy at Fairleigh Dickinson University. She did a wonderful PhD. She's a, an old school philosopher, well-educated. She's not a radical at all, um, but she is also a pioneer. Well, you are, but a radical, but a radical in a realistic way, not in a delusional way. I would call you a, re a radical realist as opposed to, you know, a delusional type. But Vana has pioneered uh, the uh, bringing of philosophical practice into institutions, and she is the most expert. She has brought philosophy into prisons to help juvenile incarceries and adult incarceries. Vana has brought philosophy into hospitals to help recovering cancer patients. Vana has has lately done interventions with psychiatric patients, which Johannes Tom said years ago should be done in Germany. Vaughn has done it in the USA. Vaughn has even worked with homeless people. I don't know how you do this. Vaughn is absolutely unafraid to be a practitioner with populations who most of us would find something else to do in a heartbeat rather than work with. I, I am just amazed. And also for the edification of our friends in the room, Vaughn and I have worked so closely and well together for all these years in spite of the fact that we disagree politically probably on every checkbox uh despite the fact that we probably vote differently at every election nonetheless we do not allow our political differences to divide us and that's the model that the country needs to understand again that a family can sit around a table and be a family even if people vote differently and worship differently there's something else at stake here a greater good and that greater good can be actualized if we transcend. And I think that Vaughn and I always want to be able to transcend our differences and work for that greater good. And if we can do it, Vaughn, a lot of other people can also do it. Certainly. So thank you so much. Thank you. Everything. Uh, Bala, Professor Bala, thank you for joining us. Professor uh, Balianapati Varaconda, Professor Bala for short, because we can pronounce that. And Professor Bala is a chair, former chair of the Department of Philosophy at Delhi University, a great friend, a great colleague, currently stationed in Jamaica, uh, doing Indo-Caribbean things uh, down there. So how is Jamaica treating you? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, Jamaica is treating me quite well. <laughs> I'm enjoying my stay here. Uh, let me first apologize for joining a little late because I thought New York time and Jamaican time were the same. So I, then later on, I understood that I'm one hour ahead of uh, New York time. So that's how I joined a little late. Sorry for that. But otherwise, uh, uh, friends, I, I had this wonderful opportunity of reading this book before it came into existence. <laughs> I mean, into print. So that's how uh, I, I feel myself to be very fortunate. And I was when I was looking at this book initially, I thought, who would call his own essays to be provocative and still <laughs> make people come and read? <laughs> right? When I looked at the subtitle, I thought, how, how can somebody say my essays are provocative and come and <laughs> fight with them <laughs> or let them fight with you? <laughs> so that was the courage that this wonderful man has uh, um, uh, in putting this, putting it on the title and the title itself. And I, I, uh, I had gone through all the essays and I really enjoyed reading them. I, I completely agree with uh, uh, Lou's statement that uh, he, is, uh, he is like a new Renaissance man or prophet of the age, you know, because it's not just philosophical practice that is uh, uh, to be understood uh, as a located, focused enterprise, which is trying to help the individuals. Rather, it is to be situated in the broader context of the culture and try to explain it. So uh, as we, uh, when we do research, it's, uh, we, we do deal with focused uh, uh, area, but also we try to show the implications of it on a larger context. And I feel in that particular 
framework, Lou's work, this present work of Lou is wonderfully fitting and trying to provide a larger context for philosophical counseling itself in terms of how cultures can get benefited by this uh, 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 and enterprise of philosophical counseling because he he talks about uh, somewhere I, I have read it like he says there is shrinking of cognitive bandwidth he says and at the same time we see that literacy rate is growing increasing and this literacy rate somehow is not contributing to the cultural literacy <laughs> and it is uh, uh, it's not helping as much in the literacy that is growing. So, in a way, whether we, whether we are towards progressivism that we talk about, or is this progressivism a kind of self-destructive? These aspects have been brought out by him so well in this uh, uh, particular work. I, I was like, when I was reading it, each of the essays, I thoroughly enjoyed them. And uh, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the chance that I've got to uh, read the work before uh, uh, it got published. And personally, I am indebted to Lou uh, because of many reasons. Uh, one being, uh, he has been very supportive of uh, philosophical uh, counseling movement in India continuously from the beginning. And that's what led me to have a discussion with him. Uh, Lou, with your permission, I'll disclose the discussion that we had a few uh, months back. It's like I was requesting him that this work has to be, see, um, people in India are inquisitive of what is happening in philosophical counseling and elsewhere. And uh, Lou's, Lou being one of the pioneers, his work has to be read. So I was asking him to write an autobiographical kind of a note on philosophical counseling. He said, this work that I've written is autobiographical note kind of one to my <laughs> uh, life of uh, uh, philosophical counseling. <laughs> so then I told him, <clears throat> Indian audience will not be able to read it if you price it high. <laughs> so you have to make it uh, uh, reasonably you know, uh, purchasable for Indian audience. So he agreed and he said that he had a discussion with the people uh, publishing house that the book would come out uh, within the reach of uh, Indian uh, audience. So I am so happy that these things are happening and uh, we, we welcome uh, Lou to India. <laughs> it looks uh, to India. I, I can yeah. hardly wait to come back to India. I mean, yes. Vona and I have, made, have been all over India jointly, several. She's been to places I haven't and vice versa. But, you know, I love India. And we have been waiting ourselves for you to emerge, you know, uh, because India is one of, the, one of the oldest, if not the oldest philosophical cultures on earth. I mean, you guys have been doing philosophy uh, for how many centuries BC? Nobody knows. But definitely you're an ancient philosophical culture. And we've already uh, agreed and so many of your colleagues have, have realized that what we're doing, you've already done. I mean, Bhagavad Gita is philosophical counseling. It's nothing else. Uh, <laughs> Of, of a very uh, high spiritual order, but it's philosophical counseling, is it not? So I think that the, the potential uh, and India, because it's modernizing and secularizing, just in the same way as many other countries have done, there will be dislocations, there will be a, a cognitive questioning going on about Indian identity and a lot of other things that will transform the society and make it much more amenable to philosophical practice emerging. So I think there's a tremendous potential in India precisely because you're the world's largest democracy. You will not have the political controls that, let's say, our friends in China have, and they're trying to grow it there too, but they're all always going to be subject to, to, to certain kinds of constraints. I think that India has perhaps uh, still a healthy bureaucracy, but you don't have the, you know, you still have great freedom. And, and so I look forward to visiting you in Delhi and uh, to helping to, to inspire more Indian philosophers to become practitioners and working together with you on the various initiatives that we've already taken. You know, we published a special issue already in 2021 of, uh, of philosophical 
Medical Counseling in India, which Bala guest edited uh, and has some contributions by Vikash and, and Bala and others. So wonderful, wonderful, because your heritage is so rich that you can take, you know, what we've learned from doing this and you can blend it with indigenous Indian traditions and produce something wonderful. And, and, and we're looking forward to being with you on that journey, Bala. So thanks again. Thank you so much and congratulations to you once again for this wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. Well, my friends, it's almost six o'clock. Uh, the time has really gone by, and uh, it's it's wonderful that you've all been able to join. Uh, I would ask if anyone has uh, who has not yet spoken uh, would like to make a comment or raise a question, um, please chime in. We, we're, we're going to, I think, stop at six and allow you to resume whatever else you're doing. Uh, but I would open the floor for one more question or comment, if you wish. Just thank you. Thank you to everybody and to you, Lou. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Stefania. And uh, I know it's getting late in Italy, so particularly uh, I will, on that note, uh, wish everybody uh, a, a very good afternoon or evening or morning in New Zealand, Bettina, <laughs> for you. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Carol, okay, the last word. Go ahead. Carol Gould from Florida, please. Unmute yourself, Carol. My apologies, because I didn't mean to put the, the little um, hand up there like that. I was trying to find the one that clapped. Oh. <laughs> well, you just did. Thank you so much. <laughs>